Hello, I'm Mayor Ron Nuremberg. Thank you for joining us. The City of San Antonio created the Alamo Citizens Advisory Committee in 2014 to develop the vision and guiding principles that now serve as the foundation for the Alamo Plan. In the summer of 2021, the committee hosted seven content discussion meetings to explore the layered stories of the Alamo. I'm pleased to present the first of these meetings, Alamo, a place to call home. This meeting took place on the banks of the San Antonio River, the very reason people have called this area home for centuries. The Alamo as a home is an important yet rarely told story of the Alamo. Everyone knows the story of the Battle of 1836 and the role of the Alamo as a battleground, but many do not know that the Alamo has been a home for more than 300 years. From the earliest Mission de Valero inhabitants to the homes around Alamo Plaza, generations of families have lived on the Alamo grounds and surrounding area. Understanding how the area in and around the Alamo was used as a home for different people through the centuries gives us a new perspective on the site. We can see the homes in the western wall and connect with those who worshipped in the church. Each of these places has a new meaning when we think of it as a home and that allows us to better connect with people of the past. The people who made the Mission San Antonio de Valero area their home are still with us today through the impacts they made on the area or the generations of their families that have stayed in the area. Their stories are part of Alamo history and help to frame historic events and see connections through time. Thank you for joining this important conversation. Good evening and welcome. I'm Francisco Gonima, your facilitator for the evening, and we're excited to have everyone here for the first of our interpretive sessions, Alamo, A Place to Call Home. To welcome us, I'd like to introduce Maurice McDermott, the president and CEO of the Witte Museum. Thank you so much, and we're so thrilled you're here. Um, I am also excited of, about your title, The Alamo, A Place to Call Home, and that you chose the San Antonio River, which is right behind us, uh, which is the reason my understanding is that you chose this place, and so thank you. It's our great privilege to have you here. Um, this, no doubt, has been a place for people that to live and thrive for over 12,000 years. We know that because we have the, um, the artifacts and the excavations that that illustrate that are evidence of that occupation over many thousands of years. In fact, right here at the Witte Museum, if you look out over here, and for those who are looking um, by camera, please come and see it. Um, there is the remnants of the interpretive the diversion dam. It's an interpretive piece of the diversion dam that went across the first bend in the river. Remember, the San Antonio River comes out at one time very bountifully, where the University of Incarnate Word Blue Hole came down, and right here at the bend, um, Father Oliveris and the Spanish missionaries uh, designed it, but it was built by the Mission Indians who built this massive diversion dam 16 feet across, and then it turned into the Sequia, Sequia Madre, right in front of the Witte, which was also about 20 feet across, and we know that because we excavated it and we found it, and then it traversed all the way through Mission de Valero, the farms and the ranchos along the way, went to Mission de Valero, which eventually became the Alamo, and so some people call it the Alamo Sequia. So it's so perfect that you're here meeting um, about the Alamo in this place of, that we call the first water development project in, um, in Texas. But in addition to this, the Spanish friars built the five missions along the river uh, because there were so many indigenous people who were living here. Uh, we're also um, uh, so pleased that the beginning of the development of the city of the encounter was behind me in Brackenridge Park. So there are a lot of, um, there was a lot of uh, encounter history that happened here. So again, I'm, um, I'm humbled by your presence at the Woody Museum, a place where nature, science, and culture meet, and particularly with your topics today, and I look forward to hearing the scholars who are, will enlighten all of you. Thank you. Next, I'd like to invite up Ramon Vasquez with the American Indians of Texas at the San Antonio Missions. Good afternoon. Thank you, Francisco. Um, I have the pleasure of introducing um, Linda Jimenez, who's a tribal elder of the Tepilam Kwaukitek Nation. She's also a tribal council member of the Tepilam Kwaukitek Nation. And most importantly, she's a direct lineal descendant of the missions of San Antonio and Northeastern uh, Mexico. Uh, she's, um, we've invited her here to start, our, start, our, start us off um, with a little invocation. 
And uh, with that, Linda, would you come up? Good afternoon, everyone. It's a real pleasure to be here. Um, one of the things that we know about Native people is most of them, almost all of them, because they're land-based and they're earth-based, have, have a culture that looks to the four directions. And so what I'd like to do is offer tobacco to the four directions. It's actually going to be seven directions, but we call it the four directions. And then I'll say a few words after that. Okay. So we offer this tobacco to the east direction, place of the new day, of new life, of long life, of starting over and beginning again, of the eagle and the cedar and the wind. We acknowledge your gifts and ask that you be with us today. We offer this tobacco to the south direction, the place of innocence and ignorance and unanswered questions, the place of the child, of home and hearth, of the Cayumara, the coyote and the wolf, the sage and the fire. We acknowledge your gifts and ask that you be with us today. We offer this tobacco to the west direction, the place where spirit goes, the place of closure, of letting go and forgiveness, of wisdom and understanding and knowledge of the bear, the sweet grass, and the water. We acknowledge your gifts and ask that you be with us today. We offer this tobacco to the north direction, the place of the white buffalo calf woman, the buffalo nation, and the green grass nation, the place of power and strength and courage, of steadfastness and perseverance, of prayer and nurturance, of the earth and the tobacco. We acknowledge your gifts and ask that you be with us today. We offer this tobacco to you, Creator. We thank you for all the many blessings that you've given us, for all the, the benefits and the beautiful things that have come into our lives, our children, our grandchildren, our nieces and nephews, our aunts and uncles, our brothers and sisters, all those people who have been with us through the years and have supported us in the ways that you have supported us in, in, over time. We thank you for these many blessings of hope. We offer this tobacco to you, all our relations, to those, all the relations that we have, the creepy crawlies and the standing ones, the rooted ones, the, the winged ones, the cayumata, the coyote and the wolf, the four-leggeds, the many-leggeds, the no-leggeds. We thank you also to our two-legged ancestors who've come before us and who come after us. We thank you for all the many blessings. We ask that you guide us as we go through this day. We offer this tobacco to you, Mother Earth. We thank you for the many blessings you give us every day that nourish us, body, mind, emotions, and spirit. We pledge to care for you in the ways that we know and to learn more. As we honor all the directions, we honor ourselves, we honor all the creatures, we honor all the, the spirits of those different uh, directions, all the elements. We, not, we acknowledge herbs, we acknowledge the elements, we acknowledge the, the different uh, aspects of life. And we, we ask that for this gathering today and for the gatherings in the future that you all keep in mind those different aspects, that you not just focus on today, but you also focus on yesterday and then tomorrow, because the things that we do today affect everybody, not just the people here in this room. And as such, we have to keep in mind how what we do affects every living being. I know that sounds like a lot, but it's true. We affect every living being every time we do anything, whether we, whenever we eat, whenever we drink, whenever we move around, when we go in our cars, when we walk. We're, we're interacting with all those elements all the time. And I would ask that you keep that in mind as you think about this, because this was a place up for home, and it still is a place for home. And we would like for it to be a place for home for the next at least seven generations. So I thank you and I, I, 
I ask Creator that he and she guide you as you go through these deliberations and you think about how to present the Alamo, how to work with the, 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 all the different lineal descendants, all the different aspects of it, all the political part of it, so that you are always keeping in mind what is best for those, everyone in every living being. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Hi there, um, thank you so much. On behalf of the my fellow tri-chairs and I, welcome to our first of six content discussions about our Alamo Master Plan. I am very excited to be here tonight, and I know many of you have been here uh, once before at this point in this conversation. If not in 2014, then in 1994 for some of you, but we are at this exciting moment, and these meetings will review the layered stories that will be told at the Alamo and how they align with the vision and guiding principles established by this committee. I'd like to recognize Assistant City Manager Lori Houston, who is also here, and the Alamo Trust Executive Director Kate Rogers uh, is here. I also am very happy that we also have our partners in this work. That includes Patrick Gallagher from Gallagher and Associates. He is here as well as, well as other members from Gallagher and Associates who are here to listen. Their firm is working on the Alamo Museum through the Alamo Trust and ATI. And I would also like to introduce and thank the committee members who served as tonight's theme captains to help plan tonight's meeting. They are Ann McGlone, I saw her, there she is, all right, Anne McGlone, Rudy Rodriguez, and Ramon Vasquez. Patricia Mejia and Christine Jacobs also provided guidance for today's event. I, am, I have been serving on the City Council since 2013, so the restart of this in 2014 has been um, very important to me personally, and it is a great responsibility that we are here at this point. I am committed to make sure that we have this conversation as in-depth as we want it to be, but also that we can make sure that all people are respected and heard from. And now I'm looking forward to tonight learning new things and making sure that we can all have a great dialogue. So now I'd like to introduce uh, one of our theme captains for tonight, Ms. Ann McGlone. Thank you. Well, good evening, and it's my pleasure to get to introduce um, our, our speakers tonight. Um, first of all, we'll have PGAV uh, Destinations. They've been involved as a member of the Alamo Plan Design Team since 2017. Melissa Simmons and John Cashman are here tonight to present a brief overview of our topic. Then our presenters will dive deeper into the stories. Unfortunately, um, the, well, let me back up a little bit. The bios for all the presenters, the, the long explanations and resumes um, were sent to you last week, and I hope you had a chance to review those uh, and their extensive backgrounds. Um, unfortunately, Dr. Toms had an emergency and could not be here with us tonight, and um, our thoughts are with him and his family. Our panelists tonight um, are uh, Clint McKenzie. Uh, Mr. McKenzie is a project archaeologist for the UTSA Center for Archaeological Research, and tonight he will be discussing the prehistory of Bear County. Next, we have Dr. Frank De La, uh, De La in is a Regents Professor Emeritus and a University Distinguished Professor Emeritus of History at Texas State University in San Marcos. And tonight, he will discuss the daily life of early settlers in and around the mission. And we also have Dr. Andres uh, Tijerina, and he is a retired professor of history at Austin Community College. Tonight, he will be discussing the Tejanos living in and around the former mission San Antonio de Valero and their influence on early San Antonio. So thank you all so much for being here and sharing your knowledge with us. And I'll turn it over to John. Our goal for, 
for PGAV is to at least prevent a little bit of an outline, right? A broad view of the topic prior to handing it off to all these great people that are to my left. Um, and you'll see we're gonna use the, we're gonna use a couple slides in this way. And I wanted to bring up just a, a few moments of intro and I'm gonna steal one of Melissa's slides uh, for it because Melissa will be diving a little bit deeper than me. Um, first of all, we are honored to be here today and most importantly we're honored because we understand how much time you have given over the years to this great effort. And as we think about this, this overview of this subject, a place to call home, this timeline um, hit me in an interesting way. And most importantly, not as all the great content we're going through that's in the middle of the slide, but most important detail to me is how the timeline runs off the page to the left and the page to the right. And the interesting consideration of, of history and the understanding, especially today, that understanding history and the best way to think about it is that any given people or event, the way to consider it and really understand it is to think deeply and consider the previous events that impacted it. And a museum and a historic site that we are, are, uh, are contemplating and hoping for and dreaming for the Alamo. Historic sites are unique in that they don't just give us objects and, and facts, but they are unique in that they also have the ability to tell stories from an understanding of evidence, but also perspective. And oftentimes this, these are multiple perspectives, not just one perspective. And the, and the great thing is not only looking to the past to gain those perspectives, but when done in a beautiful, great way, it lets people learn, but it also lets them continue to question. And, and to me, that kind of represents the timeline that goes to the right, the understanding and the hope that, that future visitors, but also residents will continue to learn from these multiple perspectives. And so we're excited to do the first of these with, with you guys, uh, uh, the group that has worked tirelessly for all these years towards the goal of telling a comprehensive story of this historic site. and. So when our interpretive team started working years ago with the, with the CAC, as, as Ann mentioned, it was mentioned very distinctly to us as we started the very first session with you that this is not just a project or is not just a committee, that this is a personal story of generations. And so it's really great and unique that we're starting these content sessions relative to a place called home. Um, home being a very inviting word, a very warm and inviting word. I think uh, we talked about it previously, but it's also very comprehensive and broad. And so we're excited to, to dive into it a little bit, hear other perspectives, and especially learn and continue to question and learn from them. So with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Melissa who will dive into the broad content before each one of our subject matters. But I wanna start off with the thought. Thousands, thousands of people have called the Alamo home over its more than 300 year existence. The grounds that we hold sacred as a battle site were also home to men and women and their children. Over time, the site has changed from a home for religious converts to barracks for soldiers to a place of business and now a shrine of remembrance. Each generation made an impression on the Alamo's history and the Alamo lives on through them and into our lives today. The residents of the Alamo site included the mission converts, the military troops and soldiers stationed here, and their descendants. These groups were ever changing and evolving through time, with each spurring new generations of families, some of whom still live in San Antonio today. So let's explore some of the people who called the Alamo home, starting with a little bit of background before there were Spanish missions. So long before the Spanish found Texas, bands of nomadic hunter-gatherers lived in this area. Called Coaltecans by the Spanish because of their similar languages, these groups had complex social structures, both within their individual bands and in relations with other groups. Archaeologists and researchers are still learning about who was here and how they lived before contact with the Spanish and other Europeans. But we do know that these were some of the first mission inhabitants and converts in this area. Once the New World was discovered by Europeans, many different powers competed to claim new lands. However, new land claims could be contested if they were uninhabited. While there were indigenous peoples living here, they were not subjects of any European power. The Spanish mission system sought to change that. The Spanish missions had three main goals. Claim and colonize the land of settlements, spread Catholicism, and create loyal Spanish subjects. Funded through Spain's war chest, these missions were strategically placed in areas to claim the land, as well as create a buffer zone between land claims from France and other countries. Missions were a way to start a self-sustaining community 
and once that obligation was fulfilled, the mission would end. A mission was comprised of three parts. The mission, which housed the missionaries and their converts. The presidio, which housed the military contingent, and the town, or villa, which was home to soldiers' families, Spanish migrants, and intermarried converts and soldiers. Through these three parts, a mission community was born. As Spaniards started flowing into Texas, they realized that the area where San Antonio sits now had many things that were necessary for life, including ample water and resources like food and approachable, meaning maybe not so hostile, indigenous people. The 1709 Espinosa Oliveras Aguirre expedition noted the ample amount of water flowing from several, several springs in the area that would be able to support a whole town or multiple towns. Not only did this location provide a way to protect Spain's land claims, but it was also situated at a strategic crossroads connecting north and south, east and west. In 1718, Mission San Antonio de Valera was founded and the Presidio and Villa, Villa San Antonio de Bejar, were settled with 72 men and their families. Daily life within the mission was difficult for, as new converts or neophytes were given religious instruction, attended mass, performed duties and chores, and learned trades and crafts to support the mission. The shared hardships of life on the frontier led to the community forging strong bonds over time. Hurricanes and heavy rains, ruined crops, difficulties with construction, and raids from hostile groups were just a few of the struggles these, this early community faced. The soldiers would protect the settlers, and one time, a group of mission converts saved the Presidio from a raiding party. After 75 years in 1793, the mission ended. Local families were leased tracts of land and given supplies, including the mission, carpen the mission carpenter Pedro Charlie, whose home was on the southwest corner of the mission compound. While the former mission itself was no longer used for religious ceremonies, homes along the western wall and the immediate surrounding areas were still occupied. And then in 1803, Preceding the Louisiana Purchase, the second flying company of San Carlos de Alamo de Paris was stationed at the former mission grounds. Known as the Alamo Company because of their hometown, they worked to convert the old mission buildings into livable barracks and usable offices. This is when the Alamo gets its name and trans transitions from a mission to a fortress. The Alamo Company was stationed here on and off for 32 years. Originally a Spanish regiment, after Mexico's independence from Spain, they became a Mexican company. Once their service was complete, most soldiers settled nearby, staying in the community that they called home. Other families in the area around the Alamo, <coughs> excuse me, other families called the area around the Alamo home as well, including La Soya, Trevino, Castaneda, Charlie, Seguin, Ruiz, Veramendi, Menchaca, and Esparza. And if these names sound familiar, it's because most of them played a role in the fights for both Mexican and Texan independence. These Tejano families faced many difficult decisions during the wars for independence. Shifting allegiances and political agendas increased local tensions as people were jailed or executed for being on the wrong side of the commanding party, which changed frequently. In the 1830s during the Texas Revolution, Tejano residents around the Alamo and San Antonio faced a nearly impossible decision. If you choose to fight for Texas independence and declare yourself a traitor to Mexico and the revolution fails, you lose everything and no longer have a place to call home. Choose the Mexican side and lose, and you face losing your home in the new Texas Republic and living in exile in Mexico. Avoid choosing sides altogether, like the Perez family, and you still might lose something. They remained neutral during the Texas Revolution by avoiding the fight and sending the family to Mexico. When they returned, they found that half of their land had been given away to those who had fought for Texas because they had not. From December of 1835 until March of 1836, Texan soldiers filled the Alamo, making repairs and fortifying the defenses in pre preparation for an attack from the Mexican army. They were stationed there calling the Alamo home, if only for a brief period of time. When Santa Ana's army made an appearance on the horizon, local families fled to the Alamo and the protection it afforded. Several women and children made the Alamo home as best they could during the 12 days of siege and the final battle on March 6, 1836. Enrique Esparza, eight years old at the time, remembers sheltering in the Alamo with his family and his mother making the most of their impromptu home. In the aftermath of the battle, the Alamo was abandoned yet again as few families returned from fleeing the Mexican army. Still, the Alamo began to draw people back in, starting with different military troops passing through, and families soon followed. The community began to grow back. 
The Maverick family chose the northwest corner of the Alamo as the site for their homestead, building a house and eventually adding businesses close by. Other families also made homes around the Alamo. In the 1840s, after Texas became part of the United States, the U.S. Army moved in to the Alamo compound and began using it as a quartermaster depot. They added a second story to the church where, along with grooms and the long barracks, soldiers were stationed. These soldiers left their names on their temporary home, and some of those names are still visible on the church walls today. During the quartermaster days, the Alamo was featured as a supply stop for wagons heading west. This brought homesteading families as well as tourists to the area, seeking a pilgrimage to the site revered for its history. As businesses sprung up and the city of San Antonio grew, the Alamo remained at its heart. Many have called the Alamo home over time. Through religious instruction, frontier days, battles, and beyond, it has become a symbol of our incredible Texas history. And it is a place of personal pride and a way for people to connect to the past through a physical site, as near and dear to us as our own childhood homes. That's why so many people today consider the Alamo as part of their own history, part of their culture, and part of their home. Now I'd like to introduce our first expert, Clint McKenzie. Good evening. Um, I'm taking Alston's place this evening, and I wanted to uh, thank him for letting me borrow uh, portions of his slide presentation. Um, I work with prehistoric archaeology as well as historic archaeology, so this is not an alien concept to me. Um, I thought it was striking when we had the invocation, uh, the notion that, that there's the idea of keeping yesterday as well as uh, today and the future in mind, and I'm with the yesterday squad. Um, w between historians and archaeologists, you know, the historians use the archival record and archaeologists use a combination of archives but also of artifacts to be able to tell the stories of the people that have been in San Antonio and the San Antonio River Valley. And uh, I want to kind of give you an overview of the prehistoric side of that. You know, we had a timeline projected on the screen that covered to 1718 to 1877, and if you carried that out to 2020, you'd probably get over here towards this opening. But if you carried the timeline the other direction, uh, back in time to when humans stir first settled into this area and used the, the San Antonio River Valley, it would probably make it close to Austin because it's 12 to 15,000 years of prehistory in Bear County prior to the arrival of the Spanish in 1718. Uh, and that's the thing, there's this deep notion of history, prehistory here in San Antonio. And, and, and I wanna, I'll refer back to that as we move forward. So this was Alston's presentation. Um, and we're, I wanna draw the arc between prehistory and into history, that's the important uh, uh, contribution that I think archeology span can help bring to this discussion. You know, we, we've had American uh, Indians, uh, indigenous people living here uh, between 12 and 15,000 years. We have uh, sites uh, that have been excavated uh, across Bear County. There are nearly 3,000 archeological sites recorded here in Bear County. And uh, they, we have mast they hunted mastodons for food uh, during the close of the Pleistocene. Uh, and we just have so many uh, historic and prehistoric sites that document the Native American presence here. You know, the slide on the upper left just shows uh, distributions of types of early sites in Texas. Uh, but one particular site here in Bear County is the Richard Bean site where the, the failed Apple White Reservoir went in. And uh, that site actually has uh, archaeological components that go back 8,000 years. And that we have here uh, you know, a, a piece of mammoth bone that's been uh, modified. So if you look at this particular image, and uh, Alston Toms was the principal archaeologist involved in this excavation. Uh, but if you look at this image and you see that big pile of dirt, that's the down cutting for the reservoir when they were going to, uh, this is going to be the dam site. And you can see that group of people kind of perched there. They're excavating an archaeological site. That is some 50 feet under the ground. That tells you about time and what time can do. They're on a floodplain, and that floodplain floods, and it deposits soil. And no one expected to find archaeological components this deep but that's how long people have been here, that that site is 50 to 60 feet below the modern surface of you know, the, the site today. And uh, we have a, a Texas Beyond History uh, 
showing a group of uh, indigenous people uh, utilizing the landscape there. This is just a, a, a timeline that documents the, in, the entire time sequence that's there at Richard Bean. And Richard Bean is one of many sites that are like this in Bear County. Uh, there's a site called Pavo Real up by UTSA that dates back even earlier. It's about 13 to 14,000 years old. It's underneath uh, 1604 now. But this is a, a, a sequence of time that covers nearly 8,000 years of prehistory uh, here in Bear County. And the one thing that, the, that I want to kind of bring back to the notion of home, uh, when we think of homes, we think of I go home. <laughs> I've got a place that I, I live and uh, I get up in the morning and go to work, right? These people lived a nomadic lifestyle. So in that sense, home for them was a, a wide area. They might stay in one place for two days or two weeks because they would move through the landscape to get resources that they needed. When the pecans were ripe, they would go where the pecan trees were. When the tuna on the prickly pear were ripe, they would go there. And so they would move through that landscape seasonally to, uh, to harvest resources. You couldn't stay in one place at that time and, and, and be able to thrive. And so for them, home is, 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 a, is a wider understanding in that, in that time period. And they relied on all kinds of food resources, of course. Uh, we have prickly pear shown there. Uh, Cabeza de Vaca, who came uh, here part of a shipwrecked expedition uh, in 1528. Uh, he was a uh, captive of the Native Americans along with three other individuals, one of whom was uh, the first uh, African American in what is Texas, uh, Esteban, who was a, a, a Moorish slave of the Spanish. And he survived the, the, that whole uh, encounter and went back to Mexico later with uh, to Cabeza de Vaca. So we've had a lot of interesting history running in Texas and in, in this area. So we talked about the Cuiltecans, and that is composed of a, a, a huge number of different individual tribes, some of whom spoke similar languages, uh, some of whom spoke languages that, that were not mutually intelligible. But when we get into the Spanish period, which uh, uh, Frank is going to speak about, when they come into the missions, the, the Coiltecan language became a lingua franca amongst the Indians and then subsequently Spanish. And again, I mentioned that people moved through the landscape, and that's exactly what we're showing here, is people having intermittent camps, moving around, uh, to harvesting resources on a seasonal basis. And they would move where the food was. And they, you know, they lived a nomadic, uh, transportable lifestyle. You know, when the Spanish first came into Texas, uh, they noted a number of the different Coiltecan tribes. Uh, we have uh, numerous Spanish accounts. And there were also cases where the Spanish were coming north to try to enslave Native Americans uh, the, the, and, and bring them down into Mexico. But one of the things that has happened is with, with the arrival of the missionaries, there was, uh, between the, the problems in the environment, there was the worst drought in a thousand years, was the three or four years leading up to 1718. And so when the Spanish missionaries arrived and offered a, a, a place of safety and a place to have food, uh, that probably was a very appealing notion uh, to Native Americans. And over time, we ended up having five missions that a variety of these tribes uh, became part of. And so that goes, brings us to where we get to the missionization and then subsequently the Hispanicization of these individuals to become part of uh, what now we have as the San Antonio community, but then was the community of San Fernando. And you know, they are still part of our community today uh, throughout Bear County, throughout Texas. You know, we, the, 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 the top Pelam group you know, have members that can trace their ancestry back to the missions. Uh, so we can see this kind of continuation of, uh, of, of the, the prehistory into the history and into today and be able to talk about how that can move forward into the future. And uh, as I come here to the end of this, I, I did want to circle back to something that Maurice had said. You know, we're on the grounds of the Woody Museum, and back in the 80s, I dug up an uh, early archaic site over underneath the, the science treehouse. And so that's a site that's probably 6,000 years old. 
And then right out the windows over here, we have the you know, interpretation of both the Acequia Madre de Valero Dam as well as the Acequia system itself, which transits the property and then cuts over here and goes down Broadway. So those two things, the commonality between them is the Native American component. It was Native Americans who built the dam for the Presa de Valero. They were the ones that dug the acequias. They're the ones that maintained the acequias. They're the ones that watered the crops from those acequias and harvested those crops and processed those crops. So the, there's this, this continuity between this deep prehistory as well as our early history uh, as well as leading up to today. And I know that there's so many other things we could talk about on this subject, but I'll be happy to try to answer your questions when we get to the breakout. So uh, thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon. Um, this, um, and thank you for inviting me to be here. Um, I uh, have done my darnest to uh, disappear, uh, but um, I keep being found. Um, so I guess that's a good thing. Um, I first spoke to a previous incarnation of um, this advisory committee back in uh, May of 2014 at the invitation of, of Maurice. And um, at that point, I did um, all 300 years um, of the history of the Alamo Plaza in about 30 minutes. So I think 10 minutes to do the, the first uh, 100 plus years is, is, is okay because it works out uh, from what I had to do the previous time. Um, but I want to start by uh, saying a couple of things, and I guess I could, uh, okay, there we go. Um, by saying a couple of things about community uh, and home, um, but I want to use the word community here. Uh, and I want you to think about community differently because we're, we're so often, um, we so often think about community as a place. But it's not just a place, it's a set of relationships. Um, so one can not only have communities of interest, uh, one can have professional communities, um, and one can have communities of endeavor. So think about the missions as a community of endeavor. And as a matter of fact, I, um, when I taught uh, the colonial period, I would, I would try to remind students that missions were not places specifically. Missions were activities. In other words, the missionaries had a specific goal in mind, and that was to create communities of Spanish subjects who just happened to be of indigenous heritage. All right? And they had no interest in an egalitarian, democratic, one man, one vote uh, kind of, of community because that was as alien to um, the missionaries as the way of life of these non-sedentary peoples that they came to settle among. They, the Spanish missionaries came from an extremely hierarchical society. Everybody had their place in it, and that meant that you were a member of the community, it just meant that you weren't an equal member of that community. So keep those things in mind when we're talking about who's building things, who's running things, who's maintaining things, um, and who's working for whom. All right, so at the Alamo, when you were talking about home, we're talking about the home of, of a variety of different peoples who have different functions and who are operating on a hierarchy of importance from the perspective of the, of the missionaries, of the Spanish officials, the people who are, um, have the power to organize and, and run that community. So, what does that mean? It means that the missionaries had a specific goal in mind, and that specific goal in mind was to create communities, communities that were supposed to be permanent. Did it work all the time? Absolutely not. Uh, San Antonio Valero starts out up here, moves a couple of times before it finds a location. But it had a previous life even before that. It started off life down at the Rio Grande. It started off at um, um, San Juan Bautista del Rio Grande. It was one of the missions there. There weren't enough mission, uh, there weren't enough Indians to support the, the missions that were the cluster that was created there. So one of them then was moved to San Antonio. 
Just as later on in 1731, other missions from East Texas, where the, uh, where the indigenous peoples were not so thrilled about having the missionaries among them and didn't see the point, and the missionaries didn't have the power to exert the force necessary to coerce the Indians to do their will, uh, they moved three, in, three missions down here. So missions are moving around, but that's okay because the goal is to create communities and you're gonna create communities when the circumstances allow you to create community, where it allows you to create homes for people um, in ways that didn't exist before. Um, Clint was talking about the fact that these people were non-sedentary. They moved around on a periodic basis looking for resources. Well, the Spanish had an entirely different idea of home and they had an entirely different idea of how you were supposed to behave, all right? So with that in mind, because I've just used half my time to give you my introduction, um, think of the missionaries as wanting to be, leave behind permanent communities, and they did. They accomplished that at the Alamo. They left homes behind. But before San Antonio, just a quick look here. Um, this is a, uh, a essential a Caddo um, settlement up in, in East Texas. Um, and when the missionaries were looking for people to settle among, they first wanted to have, um, they wanted to convert these types of Indians because they were much easier to work with, they thought. Well, it turned out that these Indians had everything they needed. They planted gardens, they had a hierarchical society, they were well organized politically, they had trade relations with other groups and whatnot. They didn't need the Spanish for squat. And so that's why they wound up coming, retreating back to San Antonio and setting up shop here among Indians who they could exchange favors for. We'll teach you how to do certain things, we'll provide certain food and whatnot. In return, you become essentially the workforce for uh, our, our, the Spanish society that we're trying to recreate on the frontier. And that, that Spanish society that they were trying to recreate on that frontier included a whole bunch of institutions, not just the Presidio and the missions that we often think about, but towns, mines, haciendas, ranchos, um, all of these institutions were homes to people of a Hispanic heritage, but increasingly influenced and in interacting with the native peoples of that region. So it created a new society. It created a new way to think about home. Indians in the interior of Mexico weren't allowed to ride horses. Up here, riding a horse became indispensable to survival. Just, just a for instance. You had to change the terms of the relationship between Spanish and Indians. Um, so let's move on a little bit and talk about the, where these settlements are, are set up. Here's, here's an interesting map. It was made by uh, Brigadier um, Pedro de Rivera in uh, 1730, about three years after he visited San Antonio. And since you can't take snapshots of things and they, they, nobody had done a map of the place before, um, he couldn't remember things exactly correctly, right? So he's got the, the, the bend in the river, he's got it going the wrong way, and he's got uh, the Presidio uh, built out the way he would have liked to have seen it built out, but it didn't happen that way. He's got where he wants the town to be on the other side of the river where um, Valero eventually winds up. And he's got the two missions that existed in 1727 when he visited Valero and San Jose. And notice that they don't have walls. And another important point here, they had homes, they had built jacales, they had built adobe, chapels and whatnot, but these were places that were growing, were evolving, were living communities in formation, and they therefore did not have walls yet. Those walls would be built over time, okay? Um, in, the, um, in, in the period of the mid, and, and the timeline goes from 1718 to 1793, and here's where I'm going, um, I'm going to skip a little bit, but I'm going to tell you that, one, um, the, the, the events that take place between 1718 and 1793 are important to the 
survival, the creation, and the change in that community. So to give you some examples, um, one, in 1739, there's a small pop, smallpox epidemic that wipes out a large part of town. Um, it affects the missions. Uh, people die, they have to interact just to, just to survive. So the missionaries are helping out the townspeople, townspeople are helping out Indians. Everybody has to build, uh, band together in a way that I don't think we managed to accomplish nearly as well this time around when we had our pandemic, um, where we've like, like largely been at each other's throats. Um, the, uh, in 1745, Mission Indians had to rescue the town from an attack from Lipan Apaches. That very same year, however, the missionaries insisted that the community on the east side of the river wa was and should be uh, protected from incursions from the civilian population, labor demands, um, uh, various vices that they accused the Spanish settlers of having and so forth. And so they made an agreement where the potrero, the bend in the river, was supposed to remain unoccupied so that there was a buffer zone between the mission community, between the missionaries' homes, and, and the town. By 1762, that was no longer possible. San Antonio was growing. It was becoming home to more and more people, people from all over the interior of Mexico. Some of them um, are military, but many of them are civilian, and many of them are of indigenous and African heritage, and they're coming to settle in San Antonio, and they require that um, the um, mission um, get integrated more and more into the town. By 1792, uh, by the way, the first secularization of, Santa, of San Antonio de Valero takes place in 1779. Um, and it didn't happen because the, the governor said it's not going to happen. In 1781, it was attempted again. Didn't happen again. It isn't until 1793 the secularization takes place. And what do they do with the mission? They make it a home for new people. They make it a home for, uh, and I'm going to have to skip along. They make it a home for the residents of Los Adais in East Texas that had been forced to move to San Antonio. And in San Antonio, and then and San Antonio de Valero then becomes a, a, a settlement of its own until 1809 when Governor Salcedo declares it a barrio, turns it into a ward of the city, and it becomes the Barrio de Valero. So you have the Alamo as the compound, which is a military center, and then the surrounding community that was all Valero lands, and that becomes the, and we call it La Villita, but in 1809, it's still being called um, El Barrio de Valero. I'm going to stop there. I'm going, I hope I left you at least with some impression, and we can talk about some other things. I'm going to go really, really, there we go. Uh, we're going to move on to Andres. Thank you. So we're supposed to talk about the Alamo as a place to call home. And I got to thinking about what is home? How do you define home? I gotta tell you about an epiphany I had once. I was in the Air Force, as a pilot. I'd come home and visit my mother. Whenever I got a chance, I'd bring my wife and kids. And once um, I was, uh, I took a nap. I said, I'm gonna take a nap. She had a big front porch and, and a, a wooden swing on the front porch. And I, and I said, take a nap for a couple of minutes. About an hour later, I woke up, and it was such deep rim sleep. I hadn't had that, God, in months. And, and I, I just yeah, I had, to, had to wipe my mouth. It was deep sleep. It reminded me when I was in history class at a and as a freshman. <laughs> I'm talking so. I got to thinking about why I slept so solid. And I realized it was because I was at my mom's house. We hadn't lived there. But that wasn't the house that we'd been brought up in. But it was my mother's house. I had my wife and kids with me. And my grandmother's house was across the street. And my mother's sister's house was next to hers. My sister's house was next to grandma. 
and my mother's brother's house was two houses down. That's why I slept. Home was tranquility. It was peace. It was family. It was community. It was security. You want to call the Alamo home? Look for family. Look for com the whole community. I'd like to talk to you from an outsider's perspective. about what home is and what the Alamo is home to. In many respects, the Alamo has always been home. Clint just said it, hey, it was home before the Spaniards got here. I feel like sort of an analogy is a guy coming up to a tree, a builder says, I'm gonna build a nest. So he goes up to a tree that's got a nest of robins in it, you got a male and a female bird and they're feeding their little fledglings in a nest in the tree. And this guy says, I'm gonna build a nest. So he cuts down the tree and says, now nah, I think I'll build my nest. There was already a nest there, guy. You gonna build a nest? Who's it for? And that's the question that I would ask. If you're gonna build a home first, what makes a home? What makes a building a home? You're going to have to have that ingredient. Next. Who are you building it for? Who's the home for? Those are the questions I'll throw out. I told you I'm an outsider. And I, I'm a historian, but I, I've been an outsider all my life. I, was a, I grew up, they called me Mexican all my life. And I know what it's like not to be allowed in a swimming pool, in a public building, a restroom, a barbershop. And so I feel kind of like people who don't feel comfortable maybe in the Alamo today. Tourists sure, sure do. Tourists from Japan can really enjoy the Alamo, but are there people in town here who don't quite, quite feel as comfortable, that it's not for them? So I would say first, let's ponder what are the ingredients that you want. What I want to do is share with you, as a historian, some documents and, and some facts that make me believe that the people who were here thousands of years ago are still here today. They were here all along. Do you see them? Are they part of your community? I've seen, I was last week at the White Shaman and I was amazed at what Carolyn Boyd has told us. She said, the people who painted that thousands of years ago, she said, they had a language richer than our own when it comes to describing the stars and landscape around them. Same brain that put a man on the moon. They were just as cognitively capable as you and I. And then I want to compare with you the ethnocentric view, the Eurocentric view of a Spaniard who came and saw those same native bands that Carolyn Boyd just told us, same brain as the man that, as, as the people that put a man on the moon. The Spaniard comes in 1590, Castaño de Sosa, and says, these people of these countries are naked and very poor and extremely barbaric, having no trace of knowledge or of idolatry or sacrifice, nor of temple, because all of them live inclined to the earth like brutes, without ever raising their eyes from it. And so their total occupation is to seek what to eat with the arrow, to procreate and to make war with one another. And that's what 
the Spaniard, the European thought. What I see then is at the white shaman, a painting that's been there for thousands of years. I read a document by a governor of Coahuila in 1674. He names native tribes. Robert Waddell wrote a book in which he identifies in one of his footnotes the same tribes that the governor did in 1674. I found in 1700 the governor of Coahuila ordered the mission of San Francisco Solano, which was on the Rio Grande near, Rio, uh, near um, Eagle Pass in 1700. He orders that mission, San Francisco Solano, to move up here to San Pedro Springs. So the mission moved up here. And this brings out a point that Frank said, the mission's not the building people. The mission is the congregation. That's how you can move a mission. You don't move the bricks. It's the people who settled in San Pedro and later that Olivares built Valero for. And when you look at these natives, I've got their names up there, Venado, Pajalat. They're the same people that Olivares put in Valero. They're the same bands of people. Then in 17, you get 1793, the Spanish government gives these people land titles. All the people that were living in your missions here in San Antonio, the Spanish government says, we're gonna give you the lands now. So they take the lands. And those land titles are all along, right over here at Van Orme, Elmendorf, right along 1604, today. 410. So when you have, by 1836, when Davy and the boys come here, and they're going to fight in the Alamo, who's fighting with them? But Higinio Tejada, who was born, Higinio Tejada Tejano with Seguin, born in Espada. Higinio Tejada is one of the same boys that was here before the Spaniards ever got here. He's the same families. He's the same lineage. Seguin vouched in where one of them requested a pension for his service at San Jacinto, at the battles of the Texas Revolution, fighting for Texas independence. And they show that 20 of those boys were born in the missions because they are the Pajalat, the Payaya, the Venado. They're the same people. You want a real Texan? How about one that was born in the Alamo and fought in the Alamo? Toridio Lozoya died in the Alamo. How much more Texan can you get? His, his bloodline has been here for thousands of years. Canuto Diaz, just another one. Born in the missions, fought in the Texas Republic. And here is handwriting of one of the friars of the Mission Indians who wrote a dictionary of their language. And here's his handwriting where he's writing the, the Quagultecan, translating it to the English. We know who these people were. They are your first San Antonioans. They're your first flying squadron. That's the people that Seguin commanded. That is what Texas Rangers look like before Anglo-Americans got here and called themselves Texas Rangers. That painting, by the way, is in this building. I'm going to conclude my talk by saying, you want home? You need family. You want home? You need the whole community. You have community out here on 1604 who've been there for hundreds of years. 410, are they included in your home that you're gonna build? You need life. A home is the life of the family. What life 
are you planning to give the Alamo? And is it going to include the whole community, the ones over here on the west side? Is the money that you bring in with tourism, is it going to go into the west side also? Is it going to go into the south side, over there where these people live? Those are the questions. I'm an outsider, guys. I'm talking history, but I'm also going to charge you with that. You want to make the Alamo a home? You need to include the whole family, and you need to include the whole community, and you'll have your home. And that will bring your tourists. Thank you. Andres, I know you saw me sneaking up there behind you. I hope it didn't move you off the stage too quickly, but uh, Clint, uh, Frank, Andres, thank you very much. A tremendous work, and I think they deserve another round of applause, ladies and gentlemen. I think the, um, it, and what was so unique is that the, 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 the material was different, certainly, of course, because of the timing, but certainly the delivery was very refreshing and very individualized from the three of you. So again, thank you very, very much for that. Joining us also at the table, uh, Christy Nichols. Uh, Christy is the Director of Archaeology, Collections, and Historical Research at the Alamo. Christy, thank you for joining us today for um, a couple of questions. And I've got to tell you, well, I have a round of applause for Christy, absolutely. Uh, I think that if we would have listened to this presentation first, we may have done these questions differently. But because I think all of you deserve more time anyway, this is going to give you a little bit of time to kind of do a, a, a summary remark or two, if you'd like. But the first question that I'd like you to listen to in context is, what does it mean to people who have lived in this area to call a place home? It's a, it's a very interesting question. And so I would ask you guys to uh, certainly give us your opinion uh, and then also uh, respond if you agree or disagree with your colleagues on the panel, uh, and we'll take it from there. I think I would start with Frank. Okay. <laughs> well, um, home is uh, something that changes over time um, because people change over time and families grow and then families shrink. Um, children go off and start their own homes, but they come back so they can sleep um, in, their, in their mom's home, wherever that may be. It may not even be the place it started out in. So, uh, and, I'm, and the point is that over time, um, home changed because circumstances changed. There's, this, this town is, um, is growing by leaps and bounds. Uh, so is where I live in, in Austin. It's growing by leaps and bounds. Sometimes, um, and I've lived there since 1981, and sometimes I feel a little frustrated that it's not the home that it was when, when I first arrived to go to, to UT. Um, so you can actually become or feel alienated uh, from your home. Um, and certainly when, um, when the families that lived in and around uh, the Alamo in the mission period. Uh, they included indigenous families from various groups because the missionaries needed uh, as large a population as possible. And these bands were often quite small. So they, they'd have four or five different groups living in the mission at the same time. Uh, but they also re required help in terms of, of keeping the, uh, teaching the Indians how to behave um, and how to produce like Spaniards. Uh, and so they needed civilians, so they, they recruited. There were soldiers who acted as guards. So the community was never homogeneous. It was always heterogeneous, and it was always changing. And I'll just give you one example, and then I'll shut up. In 1781, uh, Father Salas, who was the missionary at San Antonio de Valero at the time, he had one of his wards um, was an Indian named Urbano. And I've written about this case because it's just fascinating. And he wants Urbano to be a success in the community. He wants him to have a home at Valero, but he wants him to be integrated into the broader San Antonio community. So what does he do? He tries to marry him off to the daughter and niece 
of some of the soldiers from the Presidio. And there's a big argument because they say, how can, how can the daughter and niece and sister of soldiers who are serving the crown and shedding their blood against Indians, how could we let her marry an Indian, even if it's a mission Indian? And the missionary turns right around and, and says, sure you can, because not only is he worthy, but what are, what are you guys talking about? You, we, everybody knows what your background is, and you have African ancestry in your background, and, and you're just regular soldiers, and there's nothing wrong with these two people joining together. So even back then, um, the, the shape, the character, um, and the size of the community is under constant strain. And those are the Asanos who settled at, at Valero in, in the 1790s and were given land there at the same time that mission, the remaining Mission Indians were, were given land. They established new homes and new relations. That's what goes back to what I was just talking about, relationships. And those relationships were dynamic and changing over time. And of course, everything would change um, 50 years later, but they didn't know that. They right. were working under the circumstances at the time. Clint, would you say, in, from a more prehistoric perspective, that those were the same kinds of uh, issues and engagements that were happening long before uh, that particular century? Well, I mean, I uh, want to echo what Frank is saying, and it, it kind of harkens back to one of my observations, which is, you know, home is it's a combination of being a continuum uh, in the sense of a community, but home is also very individually centered. Uh, it, it can be individually centered just in, in, the, in the sense of one individual or a family itself. Um, I was not born in San Antonio, but I, I got here as fast as I could. Uh, I moved here in 1971, uh, and this is home for me. Uh, but you know, other members of my family are all over the country now, right? But my point is, is, the, is uh, I think it's a, the thing to, for the committee to consider is the notion that home is is not just the one thing that we might personally identify with being home and that it is not just the idea of a place and a space to call home but also the community of which that home is a part and so i think that's the the, the kind of one to echo that that distinction and in that people live things differently and experience things differently whether they're a, a Spanish settler or uh, an indigenous person who's come into the mission system. Uh, th 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 this place is still their home, this place is still their community, but the way they perceive it and the way they approach it may be different. Thank you, Clint. Christy, from an archeological perspective, uh, what evidence do you find that really gives us a sense of how people understood that this was home? Well, one of the things that we do find, of course, in the dirt is just the remnants of daily life and, and things that we don't typically find in the archives. So we can see the leftovers of manufacturing stone tools all the way up through pottery making, cooking evidence, and things like that. So when we look at it from just a material culture, it doesn't give us too much inf information about the individual people that looked here or lived here, but what it does is it tells us more about their daily lives. Um, as we kind of use that information tied with archival research, we learn more about the fact that these, um, very much what Clint uh, had said as well, is that the home is more of a personal perspective on what's you know, important to them, but the community is a collective of those homes um, and people coming together and working together. And we do see that also in the archeological record, whether it be large rock ovens that a large community uses, um, to manufacturing a lot of pottery to distribute amongst the uh, mission residents. Um, so it's very interesting to see that we can see this evidence in the archaeological record, but we do love to have some archival evidence to tie it to. And Christy, are, are we still continuing to find new evidence and uh, oh. new archives? <laughs> yes. I, I mean, we've had some very exciting finds over the past just couple of years of, of just evidence of the use of um, Mission Valero into... Uh, the U.S. Army occupation and beyond that. So it's going to continue to add to the narrative and what we know about the people. And one of the things that I found that was very exciting as an archaeologist that kind of talks about the early years of the uh, Mission Valero is the earliest ceramics that we can find here, but also evidence of charred um, corn cobs, 
which gives us more of an evidence of, of what people were eating and what they might have been producing here at the site. So really interesting things are, are to come in, out into the public soon. Thank you, Christy. Frank, you, you had a comment? Well, and actually, one finds um, uh, Indian pottery in the Spanish households. Very much so. And so it's part of what I was talking about. There, this interaction, this dynamic change and, and uh, exchange, not change, exchange uh, between these communities, which is forming a new, high, and a new local hybrid community, is, is going on almost from the very beginning. And you can see that exchange of um, kind of like, uh, I want to say styles and technology uh, with the Native American pottery, which existed here prior to the European contact. It was very much in use, but the Spanish began to use it because that's what they were able to get easily. It was very hard to get materials coming in from Mexico because it had to come in through mule train. Um, and what, in my uh, actual master's thesis, what I had done is look at a collection of ceramics from Mission San Juan, and I was able to recognize certain characteristics on Native American-made pottery to resemble Spanish wares. So things like dainty teacups and foot rings, which were not normal um, to see on prehistoric ceramics. It was just amazing to see this coming out at the missions. Thank you, Chris. Chris, you have, I really would like to ask you about eight more questions, but uh, I've got to read these off of this okay. list. So anyway, uh, Andres, let me start with you on this question. Uh, why would people want to live on the grounds of Mission de Valero? And I'm sure that that can be explained at different points in time, but give us your thoughts about why somebody would want to live on the grounds or, or near that compound. Well, first, let me, let me state that I've already, I already made, mentioned that uh, a mission really was the congregation itself. It was not the building. It, it was the building, and that was a church. That's true. But um, the mission also was the, the congregation itself. The other point of view that I would offer is that this congregation didn't live in the chapel. That was a chapel. It was a church. They lived outside. Well, why would they want to live there? They had been there before it was Valero. Their people had been. Some of them did come from Solano, from San Juan Batista on the Rio Grande, but they joined those that were already here. In fact, the people who came here in 1718 came here because there were people here. So why would they, want, why would they call it Yanaguana? Because it's a beautiful, dead gum place to live. Why do people come Christmas from New York? Why do they come to San Antonio? You have a beautiful community. And again, I come back to the fact that they had bands, they had community, they had social networks, they had family, they had security. And I'm going to take another minute Please of your do. time. Here's something I firmly believe. I want to tell you something that I've seen, again, as an outsider, 10 o'clock at night. Market Street. Four or five people walking on the sidewalk. San Antonio, Texas, 10 o'clock at night. They've been here downtown. They've been on the Riverwalk. They went to the movies, went to the mall, something. But they're walking down the sidewalk on Market Street, and it's clear that they're going home. It's a grandmother and a grandfather. It's a father and a mother, and it's a couple of kids, and one of them's pulling, pushing a stroller. That's about three or four generations. That's a family. Where are they coming from? What were they doing? Where are they going to? I'm telling you that you have a city that a family like that does something. They feel good about coming to town during the day, and at 10 o'clock at night, 9 o'clock, they're going home. You've got that. Don't lose it. Because when the tourists see that, that's the canary in the mine, they say. That canary is living and he's thriving. This is a safe mine. That's what makes you, you don't have riots. You don't have bloody demonstrations in San Antonio. You have a beautiful, peaceful, 
downtown, whole downtown area. And the river walk is just the lifeblood of it, but that family, that little group that's going home at 9, 30, 10 o'clock, that is the key to all of it. That's why they would want to come here, because they've always been here. Andres, it makes me feel like we're just on the following page of what's been going on for a long, long time. That's my point. Clint, any thoughts on uh, why people would want to live here and uh, the pros and cons of that or uh, other thoughts you might have? Well, I mean, it's the, the you know, San Antonio, because of the, the springs, uh, San Pedro Creek and the San Antonio Springs, you know, there was nearly always permanent water in, in San Antonio, and so it provided a, a, an oasis uh, for Native Americans uh, to come here. You also had incredible amounts of, you know, food resources, but you also had amazing... I gotta go. <laughs> Thank you, Maurice. <laughs> um, but, but the other side of it is, you know, uh, the limestone hills uh, that surround us and going up into the whole country are filled with uh, chert, uh, flint. Uh, the Native Americans that lived on the coast traded with the Native Americans up here because we had so much chert up here. Uh, it was a, a way to make stone tools. Uh, it was, you know, they made their Swiss Army knives. Uh, as archaeologists, Christy and I have dug up bazillions of pieces of chipstone debitage that can tell us just how important that was. We did work in San Pedro Park about 10 years ago, and it had a, what we call a trash deposit in Midden, and we estimated that there had to have been something like five million flakes in that one Midden. I mean, it's, it, we've never seen densities like that. It's because there's no place like San Antonio. Um, and so then you get into the historic period. The Spanish came here because they could draw water out with a plow and make acequias. Uh, they planted missions here because the Native Americans were here and they could have farms that were acequia irrigation driven. Uh, it was a place that the Native Americans could come and have some security from insecure situations dealing with food, as well as insecure situations dealing with other antagonistic, hostile Indians. And so it made, it made perfectly good sense to be in San Antonio. And uh, you know, it, the, the Spanish as well, there were reasons for them to be here that were both political as well as personal. So, uh, you know, hey, San Antonio is a great place to be. Christy, a quick comment on that question? Uh, I mean, Clint hit a lot of it right on the head. We have these natural resources that would be attractive to most people coming in here, specifically the church, specifically the water. And um, I mean, I think had it not been for a long period of drought um, and some of these insecurities that are feeling, this may have been a more difficult uh, location for the Spanish to make their missions at. But at the time, it was the right time, it was the right place. And what we end up having is not just one, but five permanent missions that stay here and, uh, and are considered successes. Um, creating these individual communities too that meld into the larger community of San Antonio, so. Dr. Delta, uh, yeah. and, and well, what, I what, yeah. I'm gonna switch up the question just really quick because right. I knew you wanted to answer that, yep. but this is, we need this one too. Yep. Tell me that, and I think on the desk, you might chime in the both of you, but Frank primarily to start. While we've talked about so many resources mm -hmm. and so many opportunities, tell us a little bit about some of the perhaps social struggles, political struggles, uh, environmental struggles that the, that the folks that have called this place home might have had to endure as, as their chosen location to live. Okay, well, the, uh, it's an interesting way of, of sort of shifting it, but uh, one of the reasons this particular place is chosen is that um, the engineering for allowing gravity flow irrigation, which is the technique that was used here, uh, was just about dead on. Spanish explorers went all over the state and they could not find a place where they could build those diversion dams the way they could on the upper reaches of the San Antonio and San Pedro. So, from an engineering perspective, it made a lot of sense, but it was also, it played into strategic uh, considerations as well. 
the, the Spanish wanted to claim what is now Western Louisiana. In fact, the first capital of Spanish Texas is now a state park in Louisiana. Just outside Robilene, Louisiana is the first capital of Texas. Um, and if you think about the distance from even the Sabine River all the way down to the Rio Grande, um, that's an awfully long way to go without much there being there. So the, a strategic consideration um, was establishing San Antonio as a way station between the two. Um, there were any number of great resources. There were timber resources. There were stone resources. Uh, the, the, they could build the quarries for the missions right outside the mission. At Concepcion, it's still there. Um, so it, 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 San Antonio had a lot going for it, um, which also meant that it, it drew uh, Lipan Apaches, and later on it drew Comanches. It, it drew all kinds of, of and I, I, I keep, uh, I always tell people that San Antonio's always been two things from the very beginning of its founding. It's been a uh, military um, town. It was a military town in 1718. It remains a military town today. And secondly, it was a tourist destination. It's just that in the 18th century, the tourists came with bows and arrows, and, and they acted like true spring breakers. Um, <laughs> and so they had the run of the place. And so the struggle and strife and survival of the community tells you a lot about home, some of the things that, that Andres has been talking about, because the, the Indians, when they weren't getting the gifts that kept them pacified, would take what they wanted. Um, the farmers who went out into the fields on their own uh, might be killed. Um, horses and cattle were slaughtered in the field, um, and yet the community uh, where they, they were mission Indians or civilians, uh, they, they, they continued to want to make this place work. And time is up yet again. Uh, so I will shut up now. No, never. <laughs> Thank you. Andres, closing thoughts on why people have chosen this wonderful place and continue oh, to... Well, first, I have to say, I, that's why I always said, God, I wish I'd been in his class. I think all of us. Yeah, it's a nice place to live, but um, remember now, um, a good reason or a good example of that is the fact that Texas has unsuccessful missions, Spanish missions, all over the place. Between here and Austin alone, probably 10 unsuccessful missions, and they just didn't work. Another thing that I'll point out to you is... Um, you notice that the population of San Antonio, I don't know, I'll ask the expert here, how many times and how much over 5,000 population did Bejar ever get? Over 5,000, did it? Never. It's an old dead gum town and it just never got over 4,500, 5,000. How old would a man live? 42 years of age, that's an old man in Bejar. Because of other factors, there is the other half of San Antonio and of Texas. This was a violent place to live. Why was it only 5,000? Because nobody in Mexico wanted to come live on this place. Why would I go live on that isolated, remote place where I'm going to get killed by hostile Native Americans? Comanches did raid. So, I'll, very quick. The governor, um, the new governor, Domingo Cabello, is, is sent to Texas and he writes a letter to a friend complaining that his cook left him in Mexico City, would not come to Texas because everybody in Mexico City told him that the Indians there would eat him. Panelists, let me thank you very much. Lori, I'm going to reach out to you and ask you if we can have a second version of this panel there at some point because it. it's been wonderful. Panelists, thank you all very much if you thank them. Francisco, you close this up. Thank you. Tremendous uh, education that you've given us this evening. Uh, for the folks joining us streaming or at home, uh, thank you for your time and interest in this beautiful history of uh, Alamo, a place to call home. Uh, thank you. And we'll conclude this evening's portion of our learning.
On behalf of the Alamo Citizens Advisory Committee, thank you for joining us. The stories of the Alamo are layered and complex. We hope this session has provided some insight and will make your next visit to the Alamo more meaningful. We look forward to continuing these conversations.